It's a pleasure and thank you for having me. Um, I was going to use a slide deck for um, for this talk, for this section, but I feel I'm just going to talk through the story because I think it kind of, with, with everybody's presentations today, I think I can kind of link in quite nicely just with, with several, especially with, with with Ben's conversation there and Ben and Ben's presentation. So I'm just going to start from from the very beginning. Um, I was an extremely active um, young lad, loved my rugby and football. But on my ninth birthday, I uh, wanted to take a, a new pair of trainers out for a, for a test ride. And um, fortunately, it didn't go too well. So we, me, my brother and my cousin and, and a few friends went down to uh, our local kind of gathering spots uh, that run alongside uh, an active railway line. And for some unbeknown reason, we decided to, to kind of go up and sit on the side of the track when um, when a slow freight train was going was actually coming past. And we called it tagging at the time. You know, we were just sat there and, and thought, you know, let's see how many times we can we can touch this train as it was going past. Me being the not the adventurous one, but wanted to kind of be the big dog of the group tried to, to try and jump on the actual one of the ladders on one of the freight trains and unfortunately it didn't go too well and uh, my foot slipped and subsequently I got dragged underneath the train which resulted me losing at the time uh, my legs. Um, as you can probably imagine my mother wasn't too impressed uh, having uh, only had that new pair of trainers that morning and um, yeah they got ruined quite quite quickly. I was extremely lucky that the individuals that I had around me were very forward thinking. Um, my brother ran to the nearest house, which was about a mile away to, to seek help. And my friend Ricky at the time was the, the, the more advent. He was the adventurous one of the group and the more forward thinking and realized that, you know, the, the place for me wasn't on the side of the track because there was another train come in and dragged me to, to the safety of, of the bushes that was close by. I woke up in a bit of a daze, not realizing what had happened. And there was a, a lady above me who was, who was, who'd been walking a dog. My brother actually managed to kind of encourage to come down to the site that, that where I was. And so I openly was having conversations with her and my friends just going, Oh, am I going to be okay? And the realization set in quite early on that, you know, my life's going to change from, from this moment on. As I tried sitting up and, and seeing the horror that was in front of me and actually noticed actually one of my legs lying in front of me. That kind of set my, my world alight, thinking, right, I'm not going to be able to play rugby anymore. I'm not going to be able to play football anymore. What, what will be my options from now on? You know, my life is going to change dramatically. Then thoughts and feelings were, were kind of mixed in with 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 the almost excitement of actually going to have a helicopter ride on my birthday with the laughter of the ambulance driver reversing into a tree and smashing a window and me and my auntie who were in the who was actually accompanying me in the ambulance just taking the mickey out of of the driver probably wasn't his best day to be fair but you can kind of see the kind of mentality that I had as a 9 year old tried not to to dwell on the the, the fear or, or the the uncertainty of where my future lay. I woke up three days later in hospital with tubes kind of everywhere and the doctors very very cautious of, of giving me too much optimism for, for for my life ahead for being such a young age and having such traumatic injuries and it was kind of set into motion there that the doctor kind of turned around to me and was like, and my family, you know, this is probably going to take about 12 months of being in and out of hospital um, to kind of get myself back onto a, to a, a level in which that I can be normal and integrated back into society. And that didn't sit well with me. That didn't sit well with me at all. Um, I was a stubborn individual and always wanted to kind of chase my brother and kind of look up to him in a way that I wanted to do everything that he did as, as having an older sibling kind of does. And that kind of pushed on my, my recovery quite quickly. Um, I spent two weeks in intensive care and from that moment, um, 
being moved to the children's ward really kick-started my recovery. One day, uh, a young lad kind of came in and explained to me the, that sport is still an option. You know, that there's still sport out there for you, even if you have a disability. And that moment when he was talking to me about the sport of ice sledge hockey, that if you're into the Winter Paralympics currently and, you, and you've watched any of that sport, please do so. It's a fantastic sport. And the bit that grabbed me was when he told me that it was full contact. And a nine-year-old Welsh lad played physical rugby, would just wanted to get back into that kind of sport and environment. And from there, that, that was it. That was my eyes set on, right, I want to get out of this hospital to, to kind of try this sport and, and, and try pursuing a new career, a new path that, that, you know, inevitably lay ahead of me. Another reason why I wanted to get a hospital so quickly uh, was the food trolley um, that delivered the food every day was actually a Thomas the Tank engine. And as you can imagine, a nine-year-old kid who just got run over by a train didn't really want uh, food being served to him on uh, on a Thomas the Tank engine. Um, in front, and my mum actually brought me in my grateful meal because I refused to eat from this Thomas the Tank engine. So kind of rushed my recovery a little bit more. Um, I was actually out of hospital and back in school after six weeks. So from the 11th of April, from having, having the injury, six weeks later, I was back, back in school. I was extremely lucky that I had very proactive teachers, very encouraging friends um, that kind of welcomed me with open arms, made the adaptions as quickly as you could imagine. My teachers were very, very forward thinking in their approach to PE and sports and alongside with with me just wanting to try new things you know I was back into playing football I was back into playing rugby just adapted you know playing rugby I would just sit in the middle of the rugby field and tackle someone who came close to me spent most of the time sitting in the mud because once they realized that they can run around me or jump over me that was it but I was still engaged I was having fun and going back to, to Ben's presentation you know it, it it was about having fun and the enjoyment of it and being integrated in, into being able to play with my family and friends and I would just be a goalkeeper in football um, I wouldn't play outfield or if I did I would use my hands as my feet and you know we made up new rules we adapted the, the, the traditional rules of sport to be fully inclusive at such a young age moving on then to, to how sport kind of allowed me to develop and grow you know, I was the only disabled person who I knew in my area uh, with these injuries. And sport was a place or, or the environments of sport provided, actually provided me an environment to learn and develop and understand different impairments and different disabilities. You know, I was the, the youngest of the ice sledge hockey group a year later, um, entering the sport, and uh, being around adults with similar disabilities, with different disabilities and different impairments. And it kind of opened my eyes to the fact that I'm only missing my legs. My arms still work, my chest still works. You know, I, I've still got all my core stability. And from that moment, it gave me an appreci a, a real appreciation for it could have been a lot worse. So I, I didn't really take anything for granted and, and wanted to try absolutely every opportunity that kind of pushed my way. My local school, when I moved up to comprehensive and sport was getting a little bit more unobtainable when you're thinking about the, the rugby setup and the football setups in the comprehensive schools. Um, I jumped in the pool. I started swimming. I went to the gym. I did something within that physical scope that would allow me to just develop and share my experiences. This again, just opened more doors. I started swimming with the Welsh national swimming team at the age of 11. Um, being around some tremendous Paralympians. David Roberts was, was my kind of mentor at that time. So he's 11 time gold medalist in the Paralympics. And within, within Bridgend, we had a, a very, very proactive uh, development officer, Anne Anderson, who kind of took me under her wing. She was a, a quad amputee uh, and a Paralympic swimmer in her own right and just got inclusion and got disability and knew how to create environments where young children can enjoy, thrive and grow. 
and again from them opportunities just opened up the doors to to new environments that that I was able to access and moving on from there that that, that opportunity allowed me to go and try uh, multiple sports in uh, in a multi sport event up in Newport where every sport I could imagine was, was, was being showcased. You know, I was playing table tennis, I was doing weightlifting, I was <clears throat> doing wheelchair basketball and table tennis. Uh, and I was lucky enough to bump into the performance manager of disability sport, Wales, Anthony Hughes, who seen that I was just a, a young, aggressive um, individual who would sit down and pretty much go through anything and he he gave me a tennis ball to throw and he said right just go and sit down and over the floor over there and throw it against the wall so I did and he gave me something else to throw it was a rubber ring they called kites through that and from the training that I had through swimming and ice hockey kind of give me a, a rather large shoulders for, for a young child and um, quite a powerful individual and he said right Next Wednesday, you're going to be coming up to, to Cardiff and uh, you're going to be learning how to throw properly. And from that moment on, that, that's what I did. Every Monday, every Wednesday, my parents w- would drive me the, the 30 miles to Cardiff in the evenings to, to be a part of, of the Disability Sport Wales Para-Athletics Academy. And if I was good at something or if I enjoyed it, you know, I would pursue it to the end of the world. and. That's what I did. Um, I was doing ice hockey, swimming, and athletics for a conjoined, you know, good few years, and it just gave me that base of physical literacy that I needed to not only, you know, be successful in sport, but also be successful in life and to adapt day to day living to kind of make me the person I am today. And. From there, just the same opportunities start to get greater and greater. Say in 2006, I had the opportunity to compete in my first Paralympics, uh, which was out in Turin for, for ice sledge hockey. And that then kind of opened my eyes to the real world of Paralympic sports and the opportunities that are out there. And I would never, never, ever forget the moment that I was being punched in the face by Canadians twice my age. And I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Um, but when I came back from Turin and realized that, you know, if I wanted to do sport for, for a living, um, I needed to, to kind of switch my, my ideals and come really professional with it and athletics give me that opportunity to do that. So when I came back from Turin, I kind of stopped ice sledge hockey, which was a real tough decision because it was the sport that gave me the platform to grow and allow me to find the new me but it wasn't going to get me to where I wanted to get to in terms of world success and to, to prove to to my bullies back in school um that you know just because I've missing my legs doesn't mean that I can't compete at the highest level um so from that moment on I, I became full-time um athletics and and throwing shop at javelin and discus um, in 2008, I was lucky enough then to go out to Beijing um, and compete for Great Britain in athletics. I was the first um, and the youngest throws athlete to compete in all three. And even though I was there as part of GB and, and the throws, one aspect of it that really didn't sit well with me is when I got out there, I got told I was there to make up numbers. Because are oh, you going to be using this as a development opportunity? You know, you're still young. That it didn't sit well with me. I wanted to go out there and win. You know, and I, I, I'd put so much work into this, and yeah, I was young. Yeah, I was a, still a relatively small thrower for for the, the event group that I was in, and I wanted to make sure that I made an impact on 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 the senior throws and the world para throws. My first two events were shot put and discus, weren't my best events, but managed to, to kind of get up into the finals in the top eight. And the, my last event was the javelin. And it was kind of hit me the night before my event that, oh my God, I'm, you know, I'm here for my, my big event. And was on the phone to Anthony Hughes at one o'clock in the morning, 
in tears, just basically telling, you know, talking to him and, and self doubt set in. And I was just crying to him, going, I'm not good enough to be here. I'm not good enough to be here. Why am I here? And the words that he just turned around to me and told me was just, Nath, you've put the work in. You know, you, 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 you're here. You know, just enjoy it. And the last thing he said to me was just shut the hell up and go to sleep. You've got to be up at five o'clock in the morning to go throw. I was like, right, okay, cool. Thanks for that. And the next morning I woke up and competed and managed to finish fourth. Um, I was lying in third place for quite a bit of it until the last athlete came out, Ross Love Polman from Czech Republic and beat me by 30 centimeters. And it was heartbreaking. It was the, you know, it's a bittersweet moment in sport when you have their moments and finishing fourth. But he approached me afterwards, shook my hands and was like, that was close. And you know that, that respect that we had for each other moving forward in my career was, was always there, but always really competitive. Cause he asked me a question and asked me how old I was. And I was like, oh, I'm, I'm, 1920 and he his eyes kind of widened as he was at that right because i'm i'm 40 now and so realized that i was there to kind of take his place as, as the years went on so the years went on um i, I came back from beijing with the the newfound uh motivation with with hunger you know i wanted to get that top spot i wanted to get break up into the medals the next time i had a chance but as you know, sport can be a, a cruel, temp, uh, cruel mistress, uh, and I ended up uh, tearing my shoulder um, in a training session in twenty in two thousand and nine uh, that led to quite extensive rehab. Um, so I actually had a year out in two thousand and ten after after having shoulder surgery. We had the world championships in January two thousand and eleven, and it was hit or miss whether or not I was going to get there. Um, but I had a fantastic support network around me. I had my family and friends again, who were there to drag me through the dark moments and managed to kind of get my rehab done, get myself into a state that I could actually qualify for the world championships in late 2010 and went out to New Zealand and managed to, to put them, them fears aside, put Beijing aside and managed to feet, um, meet up with Rostislav Polman once again. And this time the, the tables were, were turned quite heavily where I actually managed to, to pip him at the, at the, on the medal rostrum and, and actually come home with gold and a championship record out of having pretty much of, of four months back in training to compete. And that was just down to the, the support network that I had and the ability to, to adapt my training technique. We wouldn't do much throwing. We were spent a lot of time in the pool or visualizations and loads of time in front of a mirror, just going through technical aspects. And I took that learning coming back for, from New Zealand and, and took it into my training and developed. And later on that year, um, still progressing. So we actually went out to, to Czech Republic to, to Rostislav Pullman's competition where I actually went out and broke the world record in his backyard. So just to rub a little bit more salt in the wounds from the disappointment of Beijing. And after that, it was like, right, what's next? And it was the 2012 Paralympic games, um, the year after. So me being who I was, wanted to jump straight back into training. And after I broke the world record, didn't really have much time off late 2011, jumped straight back in and pop my shoulder went again same injury same outcome thinking right i need surgery again and so early 2012 i had to go back in for my second shoulder surgery in the lead up to one of the biggest competitions of my life and that was a home paralympic games um we managed to go through the rehab once again this time that the, the timelines were really tight and we uh Managed to get there. We got to London 2012 Paralympic Games, but unfortunately it, it didn't go my way. Um, actually at the event, there was a, a little bit of controversy within the the officials and the rules. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail on that because that will take me another half hour to discuss. 
but um, unfortunately, I got disqualified for all my throws and uh, came away absolutely heartbroken. You know, sport had given me everything, but also taken so much away. I had to have some real hard thinking after London 2012, after two shoulder surgeries, the mix up with rules and classification within para sports. Um, but I wasn't ready to give up there. You know, it took me a, a good couple of months to kind of get myself back into the headspace that I wanted to continue. Um, so I carried on working, carried on developing and, and started doing a little bit of coaching around um, and helping out my, my coach, Anthony Hughes at the time. And it came to 2014 and we had the European Championships down in Swansea. And I went to the event, did okay, finished fourth. I'm still recovering from shoulder, still trying to deal with, with, with that. And on reflection and coming back from the European Championships, um, I was questioning why I'm doing this. Because the, the fun wasn't there anymore. The enjoyment wasn't there. I was... I was a funded athlete and my own thought process was I'm just doing this to pay the bills. Why would I put myself through this much heartache and pain and sacrifice when I can just get a job that would still do this for me? So I decided to retire after, after 2014, after the Europeans. And it was a tough decision because sport was my life. Sport was my passion, still is. Um, but being locked up in a bubble for so long in elite sport, you know, I was being, I was, I was getting funded from the age of 15 up until the age of 24. So I didn't know anything else. I didn't know what skills I had. Um, but I was extremely lucky to be, be involved with Disability Sport Wales and an opportunity came up for me to, to, to be a part of their performance team and, and be their talent officer. And it was a great opportunity for me to start right back at the very beginning. You know, it was my role to go out there and look for and encourage individuals with impairments to take up sport, not to get to the Paralympics. That's just a byproduct of everything else that we put in before it. You know, we wanted individuals to, to start their journey, start realizing that sport and physical activity can give you so much more than just competitive um competitive environments you know I started off that was the journey that my sport took me but I loved it I loved meeting new people I loved meeting new friends I loved you know just being in that space and being able to be competitive with with my peers with my friends with my brother and that's the kind of world that we wanted to create and develop and that's what we're doing now um within disability sport Wales as I've progressed up we've now developed our performance pathway hubs and our performance pathway structure which doesn't just encourage and give the pathway for athletes to succeed at the Paralympics, but it also teaches them skills that they learn and can develop through sport that they can then reutilize and transfer into the world of, of business, into education. And it, it's something that I have a massive passion for because it's something that I didn't get given when I end, when I left sport, I didn't have that, that mechanism in place to kind of realize what my potential was. Uh, and from that, we are now, we've got, we're, we're a nationwide uh, pathway where we, we kind of service a lot of individuals across Wales and we bring them all together to share their stories across sports and don't get them to specialize very early on. We want to encourage that fun physical activity element from the age of nine all the way through to you know, they stop competing and stop doing sports. And I love it. it it's something I didn't think I would be doing. Um, uh, and alongside that, I, I coach some very, very um, elite and, and professional athletes who challenge me every day. Every day is a learning day. And it's I'm very privileged that sport has given me this this opportunity to, to share and give back my knowledge that I've developed and learned over the my 25 years of, uh, of being an amputee. So, uh, yeah, it's been a, been a privilege. So that's my story so far. And uh, thank you for listening. And please, if, if anybody's got any questions, then uh, more than happy to answer.